Welcome to another episode of the Biblical Hope YouTube channel. The question today is, are we Greeks or are we Christians? In an end time period dominated by progressive ideology, theology, and born this way culture, it seems that many in our church are forgetting the core component in the third angel's message. Some have declared movements like the Generation of Youth for Christ, Amazing Facts, Secrets Unsealed, and many other classic supportive Adventist ministries as fringe for teaching the importance of obedience. Yet faith in Christ and commandment keeping is what sets the saints apart from sinners in the last generation. Today we're going to take a look at how Greek philosophy has infiltrated the Adventist church and what its implications have been practically in the Adventist culture. So let's get started. Homer <clears throat> uh, originated around the 8th century BC. He was the one that coined the root word for nature. It was basically the intrinsic qualities of an item or whatever was in, in, in front of you. It was first used to describe a plant. If you were a fish, you swam in water. That was your characteristics. This culminated ultimately in something called pre-Socratic philosophy. You see, Socrates died in 339 BC, but before that we had Pythagoras in 570 and Anaximander. These gentlemen rejected theological causality and looked for natural explanations. In other words, God didn't have any factor in the nature of something. It, it was There were natural explanations or scientific explanations. Democritus developed determinism it was around the year 460 and 370 BC, he wanted to avoid action determined by the gods. Nothing occurs at random, but everything for a reason and by necessity. Here we see kind of the, the origin of some of the French Revolution ideals, uh, rooted in reason and determinism by science. Aristotle was a student of Plato. He died in 332 BC, he was the father of natural law. If then it is agreed that things are either the result of coincidence or for an end, these cannot be the result of coincidence or spontaneity, it follows that they must be for an end, and that such things are all due to nature, even the champions of the theory which is before us would agree. So again, setting up the idea here that nature determines behavior. So where does the confusion about last generation theology, perfectionism, <clears throat> righteousness by faith, where does all that arise in our church? We're going to take a look at how this Greek idea of nature determining behavior has infiltrated our church. There's two concepts I want to keep in mind here. One is fallen nature and sinful behavior. So fallen nature is separate from sinful behavior. And we're going to take a look and see how the relationship between these two concepts is, uh, how it affects theology. <clears throat> Probably one of the most famous individuals who talked about this was Desmond Ford. And his thesis was because nature determines behavior, Christ overcame because he was born with the nature of Adam before the fall. You see, for Desmond, if Christ was born with the nature of Adam after the fall, which he thinks that nature is sin. In other words, he's equating uh, nature with sin. So because Christ was sinless, he had to have nature before the fall. Um, we're born with the taint of original sin and are born guilty. So Desmond Ford uh, very much had a Greek philosophy affecting him. And, and basically, in order to, to alter behavior, the outcome, uh, there had to be something different in the beginning. Very Augustinian or Calvinist uh, versus the Adventist position, which is much more Wesleyan. Uh, but we can see this... We can see this... Uh, talked about even more with helmet on. So Ellen White said that the wedding garment represents the character which all must possess who shall be accounted fit guests for the wedding. Helmet Ott said the wedding garment is only imputed righteousness according to his philosophy. He says clothing is never an integral part of those wearing it. It is something that is put upon someone an outward cover intended to make a person look appropriate. He said that the, be the believer's obedience has no value with God. First, because it is impartial and imperfect and therefore deserves not divine approval but condemnation. And second, because the believer's sinful nature defiles everything he does and thus renders it unacceptable to God. So, <clears throat> basically, the, the life of Christ never does become an integral part of the individual. 
And, and you know, a person might stop and question, well, is he speaking about the believer's obedience without Christ? No, 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 no. Let's, let's go on further and see just how much Greek philosophy has affected him. Because you're born a sinner, you must sin. There is no other alternative for you until Christ comes, according to Helmedot. You see, he states that some believe that a sinner can live a sinless life by properly using the power of the Holy Spirit. Apparently, they fail to see that the idea of a sinful being living a sinless life it is itself a contradiction of terms, even by using the power of the Holy Spirit. So, I, I, I once had a conversation with him where uh, the, the question went, I think he asked something to the effect of, well, have you experienced victory in your life? Because um, I haven't. And so that, that was uh, the, the ultimate uh, outcome of, of his philosophy. Because our natures are fallen, we are sinful, unholy. Even the good works we perform bear the incriminatory marks of our personal sinfulness. The reason that Jesus no longer mediates for his people after probation closes is that his mediation has already achieved its intended purpose fully and completely. For one thing, God has declared the believers to be accepted as righteous in Christ. He has removed their guilt and forgiven their sin. They plead for a purity of heart they obviously yet do, do not yet possess. And uh, so what he does here is he, he quotes Steps to Christ, page 62. And what he does is he quotes it and he truncates it. He cuts it in half. He says, since we are sinful, unholy, we cannot perfectly obey the holy law. Full stop. There's no victory. And <clears throat> what we can find here is that if we read that quote in its full context, it goes directly against what his thesis was. So what... What uh, Ellen White said here is she says that if you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life might have been for the sake of your counted righteousness, Christ's character stands in place of your character. More than this, Christ changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. You are to maintain the connection uh, with Christ by faith. And skipping down here, then with Christ working in you, you will manifest the same spirit and do the same good works. Works of righteousness, obedience. Moving on here, she says, But while God can be just and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins. In other words, those garments do not cover filthiness. They cover nakedness, but not filthiness. Um, before justification can take place, in order for man to retain justification, there must be continual obedience through active living faith that works by love and purifies the soul. And it is by obedience that faith itself is made perfect. So obedience does have a value with God. Obedience empowered by the Holy Spirit. So we see that scripture echoes obedience in Genesis 15 verse 6. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. James 2.20, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? In Revelation 19, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness or right doing of saints. Scripture further answers in Luke 6.46, And why call me the Lord, Lord, and do not the things what I say? Again, doing the things that Christ says is important. Whoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings, and doeth them. So obedience matters here. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. John 8, 10, when Jesus lifted himself up, uh, he says, uh, he saw but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man. Jesus saith unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So victory was what was talked about. The question is, are we born with inherited guilt? The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. But if the wicked shall turn from all his sins he had committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. So here we see the idea here that inherited guilt, or being born with a sinful nature, 
does not equate to the guilt of sin. But Greek philosophy is affected even more. Let's look at Morris Venden. Christ took the unfallen nature of Adam and therefore was not like us. His temptations were different. So he says here that temptations are not overcome at the time of temptation, but always before. Um, but if we read 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, when you are tempted, there is a way of escape. Uh, Morris Venden says, sin is separation from God. Isaiah 59, verse 2, sin causes separation. So it's a difference between a state of being and a, a causation. If we could actually stop sinning, then we wouldn't need Christ anymore. That was Thesis 9 from Morris Venden. What about Peter walking on water in Matthew 14? Just because he was finally walking on water, did that mean that he needed Christ anymore? No, he needed Christ every moment to continue walking on water. Uh, Morris Venden says, Now, I don't believe that prayer, praying when temptations come will give me victory over them. I've tried it, and it doesn't work. So he's using his personal experience to guide his theology. Nor will verses of scripture or singing hymns, but someone always suggests such methods, and some people try them only to find that failure and defeat still plague them. If we are sinners and cannot produce genuine obedience apart from God, then all we can do regarding ourselves is to surrender ourselves, give up on the idea that we can ever produce genuine obedience. So his insinuation here is that even with the power of God, one cannot offer obedience to God. Remember that God never intended that our sin, our mistakes, or our problems should obsess us. Have you ever tried so hard to go to sleep at night that you have kept yourself awake? It's possible to fight Satan so strongly that you become more like him. Ooh, wow. I, I wonder what he would have said to David in the, in the 119th Psalm. When we talk about overcoming sin, we are not talking about being sinless. If a person were able to stop sinning today, he would still not be sinless because of his sinful nature. So here we see the idea of Greek philosophy creeping into the Adventist church through the definition of sin. You see, sinful works are what we've always classically identified as sin. But here we're expanding that definition outside of what Ellen White and Scripture have given us to include nature itself. So the very nature that you have is in contradiction to God's law. And that is unbiblical and not according to spirit of prophecy. Historically, though, there have been Adventists that have tried other ways of overcoming these problems. For example, the Holy Flesh Movement in 1901, uh, organized by A.F. Ballinger. It was very much Greek-influenced as well, because nature equals behavior from the Greeks. So then, in order to become perfect, we must perfect our nature. We must have elevated nature to get good Christian behavior. So, the Holy Flesh theory alleged that those who follow a Savior must have their fallen natures perfected by passing through a Garden of Gethsemane experience. Um, once they had obtained Holy Flesh and had translation faith, it was asserted that he could not sin and would never die. So, the summary of Greek nature and perfection is as follows. Christ had unfallen nature, therefore he didn't fall. We are born with fallen nature that is not changed until Christ's return, which is very true. We will never cease sinning because our nature determines, so we only obtain Christ's imputed righteousness. And that doesn't perfectly change our behavior because of our fallen nature. Christ covers us after the close of probation, even though we may not have completely become victorious in him. So we have this idea of once saved, always saved, even in the Adventist church. Perhaps changing our sinful nature or flesh will enable victory. And that was the Holy Flesh movement. So, uh, but if we study carefully, we can find that functional willpower is gained by cooperation or through co cooperation with Christ. The fact that Christ has conquered should inspire his followers with courage to fight manfully the battle against sin and Satan. Our part is to put away sin with determination for perfection of character. As we thus work, God cooperates with us. Every day, the Christian must renew his consecration each day to do battle with evil. Old habits, hereditary tendencies to wrong will strive for the mastery. And against these, he is to be ever on guard, striving in Christ's strength for victory. Those who would not fall a prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. There must be a steadfast resistance of temptation to sin. In thought or action, the soul must be kept from every stain through faith in him who is able to keep you from falling. 
I remember talking once, I think it was Helmut Ott, who said that, yes, Christ has the power to keep you from falling, but he hasn't promised to keep you from falling. That was one of his uh, interesting statements he made to me. Functional willpower equals cooperation. So we can read here, in short, man must overcome as Christ overcame. Whoa, that is a big statement there. And then, through the victory which it is his privilege to gain by an all-powerful name of Jesus, he may become an heir of God and joint heir with Christ. This could not be the case if Christ alone did all the overcoming. Man must do his part. Man must be victor on his own account through the strength and grace that Jesus gives him. And we can see that concept with Paul who stated, I die daily. Certainly he had a part and that part was to allow self to die. I like this statement by Kevin Paulson who stated that never is legal religion or legalism ever defined by inspiration as trying to be saved through divine human cooperation. The modern Adventist Righteousness by Faith movement has failed to make inspiration's clear distinction between religious activity apart from conversion and religious activity produced by conversion. So what we can see here is even religious activity united with, uh, with conversion these Greek philosophers, people like Morris Venden, Helmut Ott, Desmond Ford, they believe that even by the power of the Holy Spirit, one could not, that was still legalism according to them. Very much Greek influence. So the question is, does our fallen nature determine our behavior as Christians? Are we Greeks or are we Christians? Well, let's take a look. First of all, we have to understand our fallen nature. We were all born in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me, Psalms 51 verse 5. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. I like the that Romans there is past tense. It's not present tense. For as by one man's disobedience that many were made sinners, so by one's obedience many will be made righteous. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the word is not in us. There's no question all of us have committed sinful acts. But... There is no point here does any of this suggest that we must continue committing sinful acts. Now, I want to make a comment here briefly that Job chapter 9 verse 20 suggested that anybody who declares himself perfect, that right there alone is evidence of his imperfection. So man can never say, oh, I have reached this pinnacle of perfection. Romans 3 verse 10, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. Uh, Ezekiel 18:20. Uh, again, we talked about guilt not being shared. So the guilt for sin is, is not something we don't share guilt for, just because we're born with Adam's nature. We're born with or, or we have guilt because we commit sinful acts. But let's take a look here. The, the, was Christ born with, with pre-fall nature like Adam before the fall or post-fall nature? Well, for one, I would argue that it doesn't matter because... Adam and Eve, when they relied on self, even if they had pre-fall nature, still fell. It's not a question of nature that's important. And that right there, uh, uh, Desmond Ford, Helmut Ott, they all missed the mark. Because it's not a question of nature that saves you. It's a question of who you rely on. And if we look carefully here, we can see that Christ had fallen nature. That doesn't mean that he sinned because sin is transgression of the law. It has nothing to do with nature. And that's where they err by expanding the definition of sin to include nature. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Uh, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And we read in Romans 1.3 that Christ descended from David according to the flesh. In all things he was made like unto his brethren, Hebrews 2 verse 17. And in manuscript 80, 1903, Christ assumed our fallen nature and was subject to every temptation to which man is subject. Did she say that Christ assumed pre-fall nature? Not at all. Okay, uh, let's see here. Going on, he took upon his sinless nature, our sinful nature, that he might know how to succor those that are tempted. It was in the order of God that Christ should take upon himself the form and nature of fallen man, that he might be made perfect through suffering, and himself endure the strength of Satan's fierce temptations, that he might understand how to succor those who should be tempted. Notwithstanding that the sins of a guilty world were laid upon Christ, notwithstanding the humiliation of taking upon himself our fallen nature, the voice from heaven declared him to be the Son of the Eternal. Christ's life of humiliation should be a lesson, having taken our fallen nature. Over and over and over we read, Christ took fallen nature. 
And here we have more evidence in Second Testimonies. Um, the King of Glory uh, proposed himself to take upon fallen humanity. Um, sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person, the Godhead. So here we see, did Christ overcome through his nature? No, he relied on, well, yes and no. He, he relied on the Holy Spirit, okay, a blending of the divine. But that power is something that we have access to as well. So it wasn't a case of his own pre-fall nature that determined his victory. It was a case of reliance on the Holy Spirit and reliance on the will of his Father, which is something that we have access to as well. And Ellen White says in The Desire of Ages, if we consent, Jesus will so identify with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will that when obeying him, we shall be carrying out, uh, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. Wow, that's an amazing statement that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. So Christ can change our own impulses even. What a, what, a, what a message of hope. So let's take a look here at the definition of sin. If you look at definition of sin on the E.G. White estate and search, E.G. White states the only definition of sin is transgression of the law. 1 John 3 verse 4 it has nothing to do with nature. That is not transgression of the law. Sinful behavior uh, is whoever commits sin transgresses also the law. 1 John 3 4. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. So Christ did not commit sin. Uh, these are they who did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgins. They follow the Lamb whithersoever they go. They are purchased with among mankind as offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. Revelation 14, verse 4. So here we see that the final church ultimately um, leaves behind sin. Um, let's see, sinful behavior. There is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20. So this, this again equates to the idea that that there is nobody who, ha who is guiltless, who has not committed sin. Now, there are those who, in, in their ignorance, God winks at and does not recognize it quite the same way. In Acts 17, verse 30. Um, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. 1 John 5, verse 16. So let's go back to our question of Greeks versus Christians. Does our nature, does our fallen nature determine our behavior, as uh, Democrates or Plato might suggest? After the fall, it had been impossible for man with his sinful nature to render obedience to the law of God, had not Christ, by the offer of his own life, purchased the right to lift up the race where they could once more work in harmony with its requirements. So the answer is pre-conversion, yes, our fallen nature does determine our behavior. A very much Greek idea, but... We serve a God who is mighty enough to empower that which could not happen without divine intervention. Obedience is possible. By Christ's perfect obedience, he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. Um, then, as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. So, Pauline theology is that fallen nature does not determine behavior post-conversion. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching which you were committed. Paul's theology continues in Romans 8. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Moving on here, Romans 8, verse 1 through 4. You, the Spirit which gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And just how free were you set? No servant can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. Uh, we read that in Romans 7, um, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. This is Romans 7, but again in Romans 8, he continues to talk about freedom. 
For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under sin, under the law, but under grace. So again, we see in Romans 7, Paul talks about how he's a slave, but in Romans 8, he's set free. Um, grace to obey, not just grace that covers your sins, but grace to obey. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13, Romans 1-5. through 5. We receive grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Christ consented to die in the sinner's stead that man, by a life of obedience, might escape the penalty of the law of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now to him, Jesus, Jude 1, 24, who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Christ is our second Adam example. He did 100% of the will of his Father. Of course, John 5, 19. The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father doing. But what things soever he doeth, these the Son also doeth in like manner. And we read in Romans 5, For if through the offense of one many being uh, be dead, much more that the grace of God, and the gift by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So because we have the the example of Christ, we are all empowered to likewise obedience. But it goes even further. If we read further, we have an example of Enoch. Enoch is a, is a problem for a lot of the Greek theologians in our church today because they like to think of him as just one example way back in the day. But if we study, Ellen White teaches that there will be an entire group, an entire generation in the last days of our church who will follow the Enoch example, which is really the example of Christ. The truly holy who walk with God like Enoch of old will not be boastful of their purity. In other words, they're never going to be declaring, hey, I'm, I've reached that point. I am perfect. But they'll be courteous, humble, unselfish, free from spiritual pride and exaltation. Their hearts will be perfect. And we read that through perfect obedience, Enoch walked with God. He did that for about 300 years. These people will do it in the closing generation. What does God require? My dear children, I write unto this that you will sin not. But if, if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. It's not a question of when, it's a question of if, um, when somebody's converted. And that's a choice. It's a choice determined that does not have to happen if we choose to surrender to God. This is how we must know we are in him. Whoever claims to, be, to live in him must live as Jesus did. We must live with obedience as Christ did. Matthew 5, 48. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. James 1, 4. Whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Talking to the woman caught in adultery. We read here that righteousness is right doing, and it is by their deeds that all will be judged. Our characters are revealed by what we do. The works show whether the faith is genuine. Now, while our great high priest is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. Not even by a thought could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. Wow! What an amazing uh, example of, and, and what, what a, a hopeful idea here that Christ can empower us that much. We can overcome, yes, fully, entirely. Jesus died to make a way of escape for us, that we might overcome every evil temper, every sin, every temptation, and sit down at last with him. Ellen White stated that in order to let Jesus into our hearts, we must stop sinning. To be redeemed means to cease from sin. Conversion is not completed until he attains to perfection of Christian character. Human beings may in this life attain to perfection of character. Perfection of character is attainable by everyone who strives for it. So we see here that the, the wedding garment, again, is Christ's righteousness that is not just imputed, not just made to one, to one, for one to look righteous, but indeed to change their acts. Not even by a thought did Christ yield to temptation. So it may be with us. <clears throat> There's a lot in our church today that teach the sanctification 
so widely advocated, as she said, and not that brought to view in the scriptures. It's not that one. It, it's a false and theory and dangerous. Bible sanctification is a conformity to the will of God. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. There is no genuine sanctification except through obedience to the truth. He that abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. And again, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Those who love God will love his commandments also. Those who are unwilling to deny self, to agonize before God, to pray long and earnestly for his blessing will not obtain it. Wrestling with God, how few knew, know what it is. Folks, do you remember what, uh, the, what the Greek philo philosophers, people like Morris Venden and others have said before? They said that you can wrestle with the devil so much that you'll become like him. Is that what we read here from Spirit of Prophecy? Far from it. We read that that's man's Christian duty is to wrestle. The law of God will be satisfied with nothing short of perfection or perfect and entire obedience to all its claims. To come halfway in its requirements and not render perfect and thorough obedience will avail nothing. No sin can be tolerated in those who shall walk with Christ in white. Filthy garments are to be removed and Christ's robe of righteousness is to be placed upon us. By repentance and faith, we are enabled to render obedience to all the commandments of God and are found without blame before him. So when is this required? Some people would say that, that we're not, we don't have uh, our sinful nature removed until Christ's second coming. That's true. But our behavior, does that change? Does the definition of sin, sinful behavior, change in this life? Well, we can read here that it is in this life that we are to put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. Now, while our great high priest is making atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. It is in this life that he requires all our talents to be put to the exchangers. And we, we read here that while the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people upon earth. It is in this life that we are to represent Christ. We can overcome, yes, fully, entirely. Jesus died to make a way of escape for us that we might overcome every evil temper, every sin, every temptation. Christ consented to die in the sinner's stead that man, by life of obedience, might escape the penalty of the law of God. All right. So how do we receive the seal of God? Remember that when the mark of the beast comes, we are to receive the seal of God. James 2 verse 10 says that whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So when the mark of the beast crisis comes, if we're, if we're lying, if we're stealing, if we're doing anything in the law, we're guilty of breaking the Sabbath. And <clears throat> therefore, how can we receive the seal of God and be saved from receiving the mark of the beast? Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. It is left with us to remember the def defects of our characters, to remedy the defects of our characters, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. Then the latter rain will fall on us as the early rain fell upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. Folks, to receive the seal of God, it is now that we need to be putting sin out of our lives. While our great high priest is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ, not even by a thought could our Savior be brought to be yield to the power of temptation. This is the condition of those who must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. Revelation 22 verse 11 speaks about this final generation. Let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Let the one who does right continue to do right. And let the holy person continue to be holy. In that fearful time, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. Now, folks, this is not saying that we have to fight this battle on our own. The charge by many against last generation theologians of today is that they're, they're teaching righteousness through the works of man. No, no, no. It's righteousness it is empowered by the grace of God that affects one's individual works to the point of Christian perfection. Earthliness must be consumed that the image of Christ may be perfectly reflected. So we see here in GC 618, 619, as they review their past, their hopes sink, for in their whole lives they can see little good. 
He hopes to destroy their faith, Satan does, that, that they will yield to his temptations and turn from their allegiance to God. They afflict their souls before God, pointing to their past repentance of their many sins and pleading the Savior's promise, Let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me. They lay hold on the strength of God as Jacob laid hold on the angel. The language of their souls is, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. So in the time of trouble, if the people of God had unconfessed sins to appear before them while tortured with fear and anguish, they would be overwhelmed. Despair would cut off their faith, and they could not have confidence to plead their, with God for deliverance. But while they have a deep sense of their unworthiness, they have no concealed wrongs to reveal. Folks, we can see here that this final generation, this final group of believers, does not have any continued sin in their lives. After the close of probation, after the, 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 it goes forth, there is no sin left in their life. Those who teach otherwise today will someday face the wrath of God for doing so. We can read here that those who are careless of Christ's presence, who engage in conversation having no reference to their Redeemer, and whom they profess their hopes of eternal life, Jesus shuns the company of such. So also do the angels who do his command. We can read here that when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest has come. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. So here's the idea of uh, what some in our church have referred to as harvest theology. Uh, there's a lot of names for what really is classical Adventist theology, but today they want to label it with different terms. Harvest theology is basically Christ waiting for his character to be reproduced in his people. And that's what he's waiting for. That's why we're still here on this earth. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for it, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, our works, um, not our works committed absent from the Holy Spirit, but in combination with the Holy Spirit, can hasten the coming of Christ. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Last generation theology can be summed up by the text, Zephaniah 3, verse 13. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. There are many today that want to look at, be therefore perfect, as some kind of theological perfection that doesn't really equate to obedience, perfect obedience. But in Zephaniah 3, verse 13, we read about these people that though they have sinful nature, that sinful nature does not determine their behavior. Unlike the Greeks who rejected theological causality or theological interference in the natural world, we see that there is the, the power of the divine to take individuals who in our modern culture who are born this way, as they say, Yes, we're all born this way as sinners, but by God's grace, we do not have to remain as sinners. So I ask you today, are you a Greek or are you a born-again, sanctified, converted, empowered Christian follower of Jesus Christ?